Occult Confessions is brought to you commercial-free through the generous support of our patrons. Visit occultconfessions.com and click on Donate to help keep the history of the occult on the digital airwaves. The legend of the witch that spread during the three centuries of witch hunting that lasted through the Renaissance centered around the devil. A woman or man, but usually a woman, who was down on their luck would suddenly find themselves in the company of the Prince of Darkness. The devil would comfort, cajole, bargain, and threaten this person into renouncing Christianity to serve Satan. The devil would also leave a mark on their body with his claw. The witch, or newly minted witch, was then endowed with the power to ruin her neighbors' lives. In line with millennia of tales of ritual evil, she specialized in killing babies and harvesting the supernatural power of the corpses. Great gatherings of witches would take place on a sabbat, and witches had to travel great distances to reach this event. They flew on rams, goats, pigs, oxes, black horses, sticks, shovels, spits, and broomsticks. Witches who missed the service or didn't do enough mean magical stuff in the time between sabbats were whipped for their transgressions, suggesting the degree to which the witch was simply an inverted mirror image of the strictly controlled religious life of Renaissance Christians. Today's episode comes largely from Norman Kahn's classic reflection on Europe's great witch hunt, Europe's Inner Demons, colon, The Demonization of Christians in Medieval Christendom, originally published in 1973. I'm citing this source from the top because I think it's such an excellent book on this subject. Khan is an incredible scholar with remarkable knowledge about centuries of witchcraft accusations. My story today will more or less follow a portion of Khan's argument with lots of my own elaboration and exposition. Khan gives us the straightest possible answer on why people feared witches and why a single trial could lead to a community-wide panic and dozens of executions in a matter of months. If you'd like to know more about what we discussed today, I recommend going out and buying this book. That's Europe's Inner Demons. Anyhow, today on Occult Confessions, we're doing the great witch hunt with the great witch herself. That's right, Grand Master of the Order, Olivia Literal. What? Hey, aw, what a welcome. <laughs> Now, wow. Olivia, we want to let people know, because some people wondered, you've been gone for a couple episodes. <laughs> really, just a couple dead. episodes, yeah. <laughs> the, the witch is still alive. Yeah. Uh, and I, I went and saw what you'd been up to, uh, but what? tell folks what you've been doing. I did a show. <laughs> I did theater again. Yeah, now, that's easy to picture, Olivia, but uh, there was an aspect of this production that uh, Savannah and I uh, found most amusing, because it was not just any show. It was a show about... Soccer. <laughs> Teenagers playing soccer. Yes, Olivia yeah. was a soccer player I and was... played that soccer. And I'll have you know that I was told by our coach, yeah, that's right, coach, that, uh, who was also our stage manager, um, that I was number one. I was actually number 11, but I was number one. You were the number one soccer star. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Olivia was doing like drills. She was kicking the ball and passing and, and yeah. freaking like Spider webs. high knees and stuff. And butt kicks. Don't you even forget. My mom was more impressed. She said, look, you, look at you kicking your butt. She's like so impressed. All right, let's pledge this out. We, the members, members of, of the Secret Order of, of Alchemical, Alchemical Actors, do solemnly commit ourselves to a full and honest telling of the history of the occult as far as we know it. Nice stuff. All right, are you ready for these witches? I'm always ready for these witches. Yeah, you were born ready for this topic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would have had to just, like, stop the podcast and just wait for you to be done the show. Yeah. <laughs> Just you sitting here alone in the theater, just, just waiting, staring at the waiting. door. We can't do it yet. We can't do the witch hunt. We have to wait for Olivia. It to would actually just soccer. turn into the hunt for Olivia. Yes. <laughs> this is just what it would be. We'd be looking at all the soccer fields in the in the Eastern Shore. <laughs> Where is she? Yep. Since the first half of the 19th century, scholars have argued over whether the witch legend had any basis in truth. Was there really a secret society of witches who met regularly for some kind of non-Christian religious rite? A popular interpretation of the witch legend was that it was based on a nature religion, which was held over from Europe's pagan past and preserved by select groups of peasants. Perhaps the most famous version of this tale, before Margaret Murray, that is, came from Jules Michelet, who argued for a black mass featuring a female priestess at the center of sexy 
pagan revelry in the woods, which Olivia just calls Friday night. The Egyptologist Murray, writing in the early 1920s outside of her specialization, is most responsible for perpetuating these ideas into the present day. For an idea of the for an idea of the scope of her influence, we need only reflect on the fact that for 40 years, she, Margaret Murray, Egyptologist, was the author of the Encyclopedia Britannica's entry on witchcraft, which for those of you who who don't know, it's the Encyclopedia Britannica is the analog version of uh, Wikipedia. Also, anyone that's ever done a paper or looked up anything. Like in the 90s? No, I definitely... Like you've used it? You've actually used yeah. an online version? Yeah. Hmm. Really? That's surprising? I no oh, okay. <laughs> My parents had a set from the 70s. I think it's still around. It, I definitely didn't use an in-person <laughs> copy. <laughs> no. Murray believed that a cult of Diana or Artemis, the virgin goddess of the moon and the hunt, had been practiced or the, the cult practiced under a thin veneer of Christianity through the Middle Ages, until, that is, it was persecuted out of the public sphere by ecclesiastical authorities during the Renaissances. I say Renaissances uh, to refer to the many different iterations of Renaissance around Europe. Murray's great contribution to the lore, in line with the work of her predecessors, including Michelet, was to excise out the supernatural and replace it with more plausible interpretations of what accused witches described at their trials. Because a pagan nature cult was slightly more believable than a magical pagan nature cult, uh, she figured this was the best approach. Witches rode on horseback, for example, rather than on flying shovels. You'd buy that, right? I kind of would rather just, like, come in guns blazing on a, like, shovel. Just, like, go in, like... Flying. A hundred miles per hour on a yeah, shovel. it's a better to picture, but, yeah, yeah Murray's like, hey, who's going to believe that? I mean, yeah, it's I just guess a horse is fine. We named the horse Shovel. That's a terrible name for a horse. <laughs> shovel? <laughs> he was our least favorite horse. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, the devil is just like a regular guy. He sits at the head of the table and he leads what amounts to a potluck lunch rather than a demonic orgy. Okay, so it's like a picnic version of the Last Supper. Is that what you're... You ride in on a horse, sit down, and you have... Well, I mean, it's not necessarily the last one. You're going to do it again next week. So. Uh, true, true. Yeah, Facts. it's all good. Yeah. Satan's just a dude who's like past the potatoes. He brought mac and cheese. He brought mac and cheese, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> or or deviled eggs. <gasps> oh. Oh. Murray. Insert like a... <laughs> Mar <It's an> <laughs> Margaret Murray ignored the aspects of the tales she drew on that described witches turning themselves into horses, for example, or meeting the queen of the fairies, or the shape-shifting devil making his witches kiss him on his hellish hindquarters. She cut all that out. Too much. I guess that is a lot to Too much. Go get into yeah we just rode in on a horse and had lunch is what she said and that I mean, was the pagan witch cult okay <laughs> sure that's what the ecclesiastical authorities were so worried about montague summers whose work on witches was published the same decade as murray's offered a very different well not very but a different interpretation this one also normalized the witch legend into a human affair, except that for Summers, the witches weren't innocent pagans, but a deliberate anti-Christian conspiracy. Summers styled himself a Catholic clergyman and wrote the first English translation of the Malleus Maleficarum, the hammer of witches. Summers be uh, believed that the Renaissance's witch trial manual reflected actual occult practices, but his ideas and the fact that he'd brought the book to popular attention in the English-speaking world scandalized the Catholic hierarchy for the way it presented historical Catholicism as superstitious <laughs> and hysterical, which, of course, it was not. So, <laughs> to some extent, Margaret Murray was right about the Diana cult, uh, which you know, many episodes ago, like season two, I think we talked about this. Yeah, we're gonna we're we're now editing. Back then, we were like, eh, she's all wrong to a large extent. But there there was actually a grain of truth. She was compl she was wrong. She was right for accidentally. So <laughs> that's that's relatable. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> she was right for accidentally. It's gonna be on my tombstone. <laughs> So, even though uh, she got all the details wrong, there was actually a, a kind of Diana cult. There's evidence that European peasants continued to worship the Greco-Roman Roman goddess all the way to the end of the first millennium. 
In the 7th century, the Irish uh, missionary bishop, Killian, was beheaded by the Duke of Würzburg when he attempted to convert the Franconian Franks away from their worship of Diana. So it must have been happening in the 7th century if we're, you know, beheading people. And, you know, we're really clinging to it. That, that, those Franconian Franks, they, they, you'll take my Diana over my dead body or your headless one. I know that's right. As a goddess of the moon who hunted among a train of nymphs, Diana may have also served as the template for the image of witches riding at night. We ride at night. She was also identified with Hecate. Now we're getting close to Olivia's wheelhouse. Much like the moon god Toth, Diana's lunar domain lent itself to a correlation with magic and witchcraft and the souls of the dead. In ancient Greece, when Artemis was admitted into the Olympian panthe- pantheon, it's possible that Hecate was split off from her to embody these darker aspects. So if we're thinking like pre-Greek, pre-Greek mythology version of Diana, when she's, you know, this like local nature goddess and you know, she's getting more and more popular, more people are worshiping her. And, and, you know, the Greeks are like, well, we got to let her into the pantheon, but she got all this weird, dark magic stuff going on. What are we going to do with that? Uh, well, that's her Hecate aspect. So we're going to take Diana, put her up in the, you know, among the, the Mount Olympus gods, and uh, put Hecate where? Where's she going to go? Well, she has free passage to go wherever she wants, technically, because Zeus was like, y- you're that bitch. Yes, and if you can, <laughs> if you can go downstairs... So she's underworld. Yeah, but. then you're definitely a Chthonic god. Uh, yes, indeed, she got them keys. Yes, uh, bitch. So... <laughs> <laughs> she got that torch, she got those keys. Although originally represented as a single figure, Hecate developed into a three-form goddess, patron of the crossroads. She had three faces looking in three directions. I guess she didn't look behind her. Nah. Right? <laughs> yeah, because the crossroads, you got that fourth. Yeah, you can't look right. behind. No. You're not going backwards. Look forward. <laughs> That's her advice to you. Or to the left or right. She's generally accompanied by a dog, and dogs were, much like Olivia, and dogs were sacrificed in her honor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Often at a crossroads. As a Chthonic or underworld goddess, she, as we were mentioning, holds the keys to the gates of death. Also, so she's a little hermetic. Hermes also is the, you know, messenger between the dead, right. the worlds of the dead. Also significantly, much like Diana, she rode at night. Instead of a train of nymphs, the Chthonic Hecate was accompanied by the souls of the restless dead. <laughs> Olivia's making so that's me her, doing my ghost. Her restless dead My dance. ghost dance. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot this was a podcast. This is sort of, I mean, those of you who can't see, it's just sort of like Olivia moves her shoulders a little bit from side to it's side. It's kind of just like, it's like a, my arms are kind of doing the wave <laughs> yes. separately. Yeah, there's like, a little little hand floating action. Yeah. yeah. The, de- the death dance. <laughs> <laughs> So, much like Diana, she wrote at night, uh, Souls of the Dead. Specifically, when we're talking about the restless dead, we're talking about those who died prematurely, or were killed by violence, or were never buried. So, in Greece, the never buried thing would be added, but for us, I mean, this is through all time. We think about ghosts, the restless dead. It's people who were killed by violence or killed early. I think if you're killed by violence, generally it's early. Yeah, unless it's like, you know, Ramirez was like killing old ladies, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or you just get suffocated in your bed when you're 90 years old. Yeah, you get the, the that, that angel of death nurse comes over. Oh, yeah, and, that's, yeah that's, that's That kind of situation. Too. So that, those people. Well, that's sad. <laughs> we were having such a good time. <laughs> Had to go talking about angel yep. of death nurses. <laughs> I got to think about old people dying prematurely, <laughs> <laughs> it I'm, seems yeah. kind of like a weird thing to they say. They could have gone another week or three. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. That's horrible. We love our elders. We do. We love our elderly love listeners. Them. Specifically them. Um, so, <laughs> these souls of the restless dead disguise themselves as women. Hecate's German equivalent was Holda or Hala. You know this this one? No. Nah. Oh, cool. This will be fine. fun. Uh, she was a supreme goddess who actually predated Odin, Freya, Thor, and Loki. Okay. Yeah. Her festival was held in the depths of the winter around what we would now call Christmas time, and she was associated with weaving and witchcraft. Oh, hell yeah. Holda looked over the souls of children who died in infancy, 
and formed her ghostly train uh, riding with her by night. Uh, so all those infant souls. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's who's with her. She's like surrounded by these babies. That's kind of sick. These flying babies. Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, while Holda punishes laziness, like Demeter, she is the patron of fruitfulness and productivity. And, like a certain red-suited elf, also popularly associated with the winter solstice, she likes to push presents through the windows of believers. Oh. Yeah, I, I've been making this point quiet, not so quietly, for, uh, I don't know, this series, but I don't know, since the beginning. Santa is a pagan entity. Period. Yes, and that is a debate that <laughs> oh, at home? I've been having with oh, really? someone. Really? Well, we I just uh me and my partner we debate on if we have kids if if Santa is going to be a thing or not. Oh man, I am so with you. And it's the only thing that I had that he really has like going for him is like if our kid doesn't know, are they going to be, like, ridiculed in school or, like... Well, there were always the Jewish kids at school. That's what I'm saying. It's not like they don't need... They, they weren't in the program. They can know it exists. But, like, I also... The are Hindu they going to, like, spoil it for other kids? I don't know. I don't... The Jewish and the Hindu kids, they didn't spoil it for people, I don't... As I recall. I don't know. I, I'm also I, struggling with this. My wife is kind of, like, sort of doing it, but I'm just not pushing it. So that's how... That's our... Yeah. That's our compromise. Like, she can push it, and I just, like, kind of roll my eyes quietly in the background. I'm like, yeah. And then, then Corinne will be something like, yeah, Santa. Daddy is Santa. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's wildly accurate. <laughs> you don't even know how accurate. <laughs> Good job. You've seen through the, li- the bullshit. I just don't want to lie directly to a child. I, I don't know. But I know, it's If tough. it's like a healthy lie, is that the argument? I don't know. I think the whole house of cards comes down for you, right? Where you realize your parents have been bullshitting you by the time you're eight or nine years old. I don't remember ever really believing in Santa, though. <laughs> like, that's my problem, too. You never had like, the illusion. My dad was very much so like, I got you this shit, and don't you forget it. <laughs> All right, so our pagan friends out there who are having this same problem, what we're trying to tell you is you don't have to tell your kid about Santa. Right, you can right. tell your kid about Holda. Yeah, honestly, this is kind of like, if I could just throw presents in my kid's window at night, <laughs> <laughs> that's like it. My kid is also obsessed with death, as Olivia knows. She's like, oh, that tree's dead. What happens to that? Oh, that plant died. What happens to are those bones? A dead animal? Like, she loves this. So she, if I told her that an a, a ancient goddess would arrive, well, she also has a book called the, yeah. uh, the, A Goddess Book that I read to her, so she's well informed. Uh, she's often like, Daddy, do we have to read the goddess book? But we have to. So <laughs> if I say this ancient goddess is arriving with a train of dead babies, I think she'd say, okay, that's all cool. right with me. And there sick. will be presents. Yeah, there's yeah. still presents. Right at your window. That's all they care about. It's more convenient than all that tree nonsense. You just right, be right on the window, so. <laughs> Some women believed that they could send their souls by night to travel with Holda and her retinue. But... These women were not mating with demons or inflicting harm on their neighbors. They were, in fact, going from house to house and giving people stuff. Wow. A similar legend observed by the Paris Bishop William of Auvergne in the 13th century tells of Lady Abondita or Satya, a myth that preserved belief in the Roman goddess Abondantia into, the medieval, into medieval Europe. So they've got this ancient Roman goddess Abondantia, and uh, this bishop is like Lady Abundita. She's real, and she gives you stuff. Uh. <laughs> French peasants would leave food and drink for the lady and her night travelers, uh, and though they ate of it, the food was not diminished. So you put out a cake, and they would have the whole cake, but then when you woke up in the morning, the cake would still be there. Sick. Yeah, you get to eat it, too. In exchange, she would bless those who were hospitable to her with prosperity and abundance. Although the good bishop attributed these visions to demons, it's clear they did no harm. So when I said he was bringing it back, I mean he was bringing it back in order to blame people for believing in it. But that means it was there. People in France were with this goddess, much like they were with Hulda and they were with Diana. So this tradition of the you know goddess riding by night with a train that may include women who are flying in the air, like this is sounding familiar. It's not just Santa, it's also witches. 
In Milan, in the late 14th century, two women claimed to worship Diana. Twice a week, they met with her society, which included the living and the dead, and every kind of animal which they ate, but the goddess revived. That's some, that's some weird stuff. <laughs> I don't know if I like that. You take a bite out of that cow, and then it just comes back to life. That's where I think I might yeah. draw the line. <laughs> Dionysus didn't get into that stuff. He'd let you rip it apart, and he'd leave it where it was. That's, that's the <laughs> natural way. I that's, don't know. That's the natural way. They traveled around to the houses of the rich, which the goddess blessed if they were in good order. Uh, so she, she was wow, really okay, stickler. Blessing the rich? <laughs> yes. The rich don't need to be blessed. The rich and the organized. Well, those are the people that are the <laughs> least needing to be blessed. That's some... I don't know about that. She taught the use of herbs to cure disease uh, and how to divine theft or sorcery should you be the victim of these things. For the rich? Apparently. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. For the most part, the educated elite among the clergy and aristocracy regarded these stories as delusions. At worst, they were illusions brought on by demons, even if they did no harm to anyone but the person suffering the hallucination. Dear Father Confessor, I was visited by the Lady of the Night. My little ones have been sorrowfully hungry since the frost came early, and she left bread and milk and pickled preserves. She also reassured me that my little Rachel died just out of the womb, was well and in her company. What wickedness! What evil you describe! T'was a demon gave you bread and milk and made you feel better about things? Repent, peasant! Beg forgiveness! Anyway. But, as time wore on into the 14th and 15th century, these folk traditions gradually transformed in the minds of the Christians who encountered them from devilish illusions into legitimate tales of actual night rides conducted for the sake of a devil. In Legends of Diana, Hecate, Holda, and Abondita, we can see the origins of the myth of the shovel-straddling witch flying to meet with the devil at midnight. As you can tell, I really like the shovel idea. I think it's No, I do too. Cool. I'm, I'm, in, I'm yeah. in the shovel. You would you if you had your choice yeah. of garden tools to fly on. Just really anything to fly on now <laughs> or really any way to transport myself, I'm now really like really into the riding a shovel. Flying, by the way, was important to make witchcraft accusations hold because if these raucous Sabbaths were happening in or near the village, somebody would probably notice. Yeah. So witches had to fly. If they flew 50 or 100 miles off, this would account for the fact that nobody ever saw the witch doing her evil deeds. Because it was 50 or 100 yards, you know, 100, you know, and then right. she's like cursing you and your stuff. Right. This woman tells tales of nocturnal visits. I begin to suspect she's been conducting orgies with goats and murdering children with a hundredfold demons in her backyard. In my backyard? Would I not wake the village with such carryings on? Good point! She's been conducting orgies with goats and murdering children with a hundredfold demons? Like far away in the other side of the mountains or something, where we can't hear it so easy. If the Diana and Hecate lure and cults help us understand where we got the witch riding by night to the Sabbath, uh, that is to say how we got the idea of a witch riding by night, the Sabbath itself was simply a repurposing of ages old tropes of ritual evil. Whether we're talking about the way Romans slandered second century Christians or the way Christians slandered Gnostics, Jews, and a host of different medieval heretics, including the Fraticelli and Waldensians, two elements always rise to the top of the rumor. Number one, children are being murdered. Number two, we are having illicit sex. Woo! Go, witches, go. Insert party in the USA. <laughs> yes, that's its appropriate connotation. That's where it was meant to be played. None of the tales told about these groups were true, but they were a way of saying the worst thing a community could think of about a group they found threatening, something we've discussed on many episodes. Child sacrifice was a prerequisite for getting into the witch's sabbat, and the devil might beat you for not killing enough infants the week before. Goddamn. For this reason, midwives were often accused of witchcraft, particularly when an infant died in childbirth, which was not so uncommon. That sucks. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you would go into the field. You, 
you must really love helping women possibly die while giving birth. You think about the medical, you know, the way medicine functioned in the 15th century. You you had a reasonable odds that your kid was going to be going to die in childbirth yeah. or that you might potentially die in childbirth. Right. So that midwife, she's carrying a lot of water for the community. That's why I'm like, she's definitely seeing more death than birth, right? Oh, I don't know. But she's seeing much more death than your midwife would today. That's for sure. And the main event at the Sabbaths itself was sex with the devil's barbed penis and various succubi and incubi gathered for the cannibalistic feast. It's like a cat. Yeah, he's a little little catty. Or do foxes have barbed penises? I don't know. Lions have yeah, barbed penises. Yeah, right. Cats yeah. and stuff. But I didn't know if anyway. We both looked at <laughs> Ryan <Yeah>. like <laughs> like he knew. Like he is the he's fox the master. Ryan's here watching us, and uh, yeah, he's he's the expert on barbed penises. <laughs> he's always every Can time confirm? I see him, he's like, "Hey, Rob, uh, you know what has a barbed penis?" And I'm like, no, Ryan, what is a barbed penis? He just says the same animal <laughs> every single time. He always says a lion. Um, <laughs> so, speaking uh, of the Waldensians, remember I mentioned them in the Fraticelli? The Waldensians sit pretty close to the origins of the witch trials themselves. The Waldensians were a heretical sect of Christians with communities scattered around Europe who believed that the official clergy were not ascetic or virginal enough to qualify as Christian sl- clergy. This sounds strange, right? That the, the priests, the celibate priests, are not virginal enough. Nah, man. In short, the Catholic hierarchy, uh, they said, had too much stuff and were too much of this world, uh, also were having too much sex, to preach a message about the next world. Exactly the sort of people who you would accuse of conducting demonic orgies. All right, let's pick on the church for a second. Let's pick on the church. Because at first, it was just the church that could be witches, basically. Yeah. Or, well, maybe not witches, but doing witchcraft, necromancy. Oh, yeah, yeah. The ma- yeah, not, they're not, not witchcraft per se, but yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah. We'll get into that a little bit. Maleficium. Yeah. 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 So, witches' murderous sexual impropriety was a kind of fever dream version of the actual sexual impropriety happening in the church. Blaming mit- witches uh, may have been a way for clergy to lessen their own guilt by blaming midwives, for example, of doing much worse than they were doing, albeit without any evidence. Yeah, just bringing life into the world. Their guilt, by the way, was by no means a private affair unknown to their congregations or the European public at large, because I'm about to tell you some stories. Story time! (laughs) (laughs) Members of the church, from priest to pope, often did break their vow of celibacy in painfully public ways. No. Yes. (laughs) Let's do this ASMR style. (laughs) In the 15th century. In the 15th century, Pope Innocent VIII married his illegitimate son. That's right. Innocent VIII married his <laughs> illegitimate son. And that's on the church. Right. He was definitely trying to cover some stuff up when they asked him to pick his pope name. Uh, to <laughs> I'm, innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Didn't you have an innocent? The he pled the fifth, basically, with I'm his name. Innocent the fifth, eighth. Illegitimate son uh, married his illegitimate son to Maddalena de Medici in exchange. Yeah, you got to get them Medicis. Well, you're the Pope, so you're going to get a Medici if you you want one. You got to. In exchange for granting a cardinal's hat to Lorenzo de Medici's 13 year old son, Giovanni, also known as Pope Leo X. That again, (laughs) illegitimate son married into the Medicis. And the exchange was I will make your. Your thirteen, your middle school age son, a cardinal, <laughs> and that cardinal went on to be pope. Yeah. Oh, the medieval church. I mean, as a thirteen-year-old, like you gotta have a complex. <laughs> like you gotta develop a complex if, if someone's like, "You're a cardinal now." <laughs> Congrats. Good luck. You're going to die probably in like eight or nine years, but like, here you go. Leo, by the way, 
that that 13 year old cardinal was accused of homosexual acts and wasn't the first pope subjected to such rumors paul ii was said to have died from eating a bad melon but there were whispers in the halls of the vatican that he'd been sodomized to death by a page that is homophobic in so many ways (laughs) but the bad melon is also bizarre his successor sixtus the fourth which is a wildly confusing pope name sixtus the fourth sixtus the fourth that's just fucked up yeah you get to be sixtus the sixth or no sixtus at all (laughs) (laughs) anyway it's it's not even like on its own it's not even like a good word to say like it's not like easy to nobody's listening and saying i need to name my kid sixtus Sixtus. it's like your mouth doesn't want to say (laughs) (laughs) but he picked it of all the pope names Sextus was known for promoting attractive young men within the clergy, possibly for sexual favors. But that's only rumors. Perhaps the most famous non-celibate Renaissance pope was Alexander VI, born Rodrigo de Borgia. Olivia's favorite of the Renaissance popes, I believe, yes? Yeah, I guess by default, because I don't know how many other ones I really could tell you that much about. (laughs) I just happen to, yeah, think that the Borgia family is just fascinating. So, let's talk about him. Alexander had several mistresses, but a long-standing relationship with Vanozza de Catanai, who had three husbands in her lifetime. Pope Alexander, for his part, uh, with de Catanai, had four children. Cesar, Giovanni, Lucrezia, and Geoffrey who Alexander, by the way, pretended were his nieces and nephews until he became Pope and then just legitimized. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, that's the perk. (laughs) I'm the Pope. What you gonna do? Yep, they're my kids. I'm infallible. After he became Pope, Alexander's affections for Decatenai waned in favor of Julia Farnese, who was also married. The Borgia Pope was in the habit of playing political games, by the way, with his daughter Lucrezia's marriages involving annulments and attempted assassinations, and this led one bitter father-in-law to accuse Alexander, probably falsely, of having incestuous relations with Lucrezia. The darkest, I think, of the Borgia accusations, but just the actual historical stuff Alexander did was not very popey. I think in the show, they try to make it a sibling incest thing yeah i don't think they wanted to go where it it, actually went historically they made it uh lucrezia and then caesar or whatever the yeah the older one the Mm -hmm. cardinal one or whatever yeah that would be more i guess it's probably just easier to swallow for a modern audience well they just kind of like threw it like they made it like kind of weird the whole time like they had a weird close like too close relationship like it gave me like tis pity vibes but like (laughs) but then like i don't know yeah. They just like threw it, but the, that show also got canceled, so it ended in a bizarre ass place. Yeah, that's that's a shame too. I I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, L- Olivia's making reference, by the way, to John Ford's "Tis Pity She's a Whore," which was oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. the way Olivia and I met. I was directing that production, and Olivia was uh, the whore. Young. 18 19 year old whore and uh, the story is uh, <laughs> that to the annabella the main character she is uh, ends up in an incestuous relationship with her brother who then uh, carves out her heart and presents it to her father after she gets pregnant oh wait <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah after you yeah, said yeah also that, yeah. the yeah the kid yeah well that was a fun show fun show also also written in the 16th century or 17th early 17th century The Waldensians were at the forefront of accusing uh, these popes and priests of breaking their vows, and this prompted the orgiastic accusations against them and subsequent executions. In this way, the Waldensians sent the precedent for the witch trials, but they weren't actually accused of being witches. One of the earliest instances of witch trials took place in the valleys south of the Rhone in Switzerland. There, witches were tortured into confessions of killing livestock, rendering men and women infertile, drying up cow's milk, and ruining crops. They applied a magical salve to chairs and flew around by night, I guess just like comfortably seated. (laughs) Good chair. (laughs) Off we go. go. Soothing chair. Yeah, it would be sort of like an airplane, but without the plane. It's just the seat 
It's just fucking, sailing why through are the you air. Putting the bombs on the chair. It's magic, magic chair it's bomb. A soothing bomb, though. That's oh, what I can't. <laughs> yes, I can't get over like a magical salve. It's like a process of making the chair happy first. <laughs> then it'll fly. Yeah, wow. the, if our chairs were on, all of our chairs are unhappy. If we could just elevate their mood. We right. could fly anywhere on if these chairs. you said chairs. that to me when I was high enough, I <laughs> would have to sit there for a moment and think about it. <laughs> so, uh, wh- what these witches would do is they would drink your wine. They would break into your house and drink your wine with your children. Um, and by that, I don't mean Wait. that they would... Im- no, no, no. <laughs> They're not inviting your children out to party. They're going to murder, cook, and eat your children. <laughs> I mean, they're pairing the wine. Oh, sorry with your children I'm just picturing a bunch of like witches being like hey, you want an underage drink <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of badass though i mean if that were true i guess there wasn't really underage drinking back then yeah it's not so bad but it's like <laughs> like if that became like a an urban legend that a woman will fly up to your house <laughs> seated comfortably seated in like a recliner she will break into your home and then she will get you to to underage drink that's a pretty cool, that's bloody mary 20 21st century bloody mary i'm gonna tell my kids that just <laughs> yes. so they never like steal alcohol from if the you house champ bloody mary into the mirror enough times a woman in a recliner will show up to your door and give you your parents alcohol yep in 1459 the practice of naming co-conspirators in you know witch accusations resulted in widespread persecution in northern france a hermit of langres named a young prostitute and artist an artist by the way who was known for his poems in honor of the virgin mary named these two as members of the witch cult before he was burned these two named more so in other words, the hermit was accused first, and he was like, they were like, who are your co-conspirators? And he was like, this prostitute, and also this other guy that writes poems about uh, Mary. Then they got these two, and they named more, and the conspiracy spread. Their inquisitors were particularly interested in ferreting out witches among the clergy and the aristocracy. They were promised that they would only be burned if they persisted in denying their involvement. If they confessed, their penance would be no worse than a short pilgrimage, which later in the witch trials could be true and was often true, but not this time. After they confessed and named names, they were tied to the stake and immolated. As the flames consumed them, they cried out denials of all they'd been coerced to confess. Terror. Terror gripped the city of Arras as the acting bishop Jean and the doctor of laws and dean of the Dominican order Jacques de Bois persecuted their way up the social ladder from prostitutes to wealthy merchants. Finally, the Duke of Burgundy consulted with a group of learned doctors of law on the proceedings and sent his herald to oversee the trials. Immediately, the accusation stopped and the Inquisition began to fall apart. So when you sent like actual lawyers, not just these crazy bumpkins who are, you know, twisting people's arms into, you know, confessing, then it, it totally ruined the whole thing. The party was over. These guys were from out of town and they were not on board with this insanity. Jacques de Boy pressed the inquisitors to proceed, but their sentences had grown erratic. Sometimes they would sentence you to life, sometimes a large fine, and sometimes they would kill you. The Inquisitors lost faith in the truth of what they were hearing, and one of the accused managed to get a hearing in Paris. Jacques de Bois, for his part, went mad and died within the year. While the church was primarily concerned with burning witches for attending the Sabbath, there was a long folk tradition of belief in maleficium. So this is another potential source of, of these witch trials. Men who suffered impotence when they left one woman to marry another blamed the jilted woman for cursing them. New wife, Gretchen. I wax most sore at thy sister, my former wife, Greta. For not only was she unable to bring forth any brood, despite near daily sowings of my seed amongst her lush garden patch, but now she has cursed mine member in vengeance, such that mine seed doth not take root in thine womb. For there could be nothing whatsoever wrong with mine seed. It is a mighty seed. Many mighty seeds. I'm just chock full of really good and strong seeds like the best seeds that have ever been. Your sister's the worst. 
Cowherds and swineherds said prayers over bread, herbs, and knotted cords, which they buried at a fork in the road to ward off pests and injury and to force them onto uh, pest, those pests and injury, by the way, onto other flocks. So Olivia would be like, uh, hey, uh, I, oh dear, you know, spirits, if the pests are coming, let them go over to Rob's flock that way. So she's not really, you know, she doesn't have anything against me necessarily. She just doesn't want her own flock to be all pested up. Uh, Am I right? It's survival of the fittest, man. Yeah, that's all it is. A little Darwinian magic. Yeah, it's not my fault. They, they just happen <laughs> to float on over there. Dar- Darwinian maleficium. You heard it here. Oh, God. <laughs> the laws the laws of the Visigoths, by the way, addressed uh, another group of uh, maleficium folks called the Tempestari. Have you ever heard of these guys? Storm raisers? These were people. It sounds like something from like D and D, honestly. <laughs> like, it might be, yeah. They, they, maybe they used it. These people could conjure storms and ruin crops, uh, and they were punished with two hundred lashes. Uh, they would also shear your head, and then there would be an embarrassing parade. Oh, damn! Okay. Yeah. In the Middle Ages, storm makers were said to be able to fly and worked on behalf of aerial sailors. <laughs> the fuck? Wait, what? People, what? So sailors in airships are just sending these witches out? Or? Yeah, well, the, the Mount, yeah, these Tempestari. They're not quite witches, oh. but they're Tempestari because they can only raise storms and Sorry. they're, you know, they're not making deals characters. with the devils. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Got it. <laughs> uh, so, that, yeah, they would go and work for these uh, airboat sailors, which is cool. They traveled on cloud Wait, ships. You say airboat? Do you literally mean like some treasure planet shit? Or cloud, like... they're cloud ships. They were they were cloud C L O U D cloud cloud ships. That's ships not of real, cloud. right? No, I don't <laughs> think not... so. Which is a damn shame. <laughs> okay. But the airships come up with uh, Helena Blavatsky. The Hindus. There were some lore about airships. I just love airships as a theme, so I love this idea that it was also a European. I'm just thing. gonna think treasure planet. So uh, these cloud ships would drop out of the sky to steal crops, and then they would carry them off to sell in a mystical land called Mangonia. In the ninth century, Agobard of Lyon detailed this tradition. But we have seen and heard of many people overcome with so much foolishness, made crazy by so much stupidity, that they believe and say that there is a certain region which is called Magonia from which ships come in the clouds. In these ships, the crops that fell because of hail and were lost in storms are carried back into that region. Evidently, these aerial sailors make a payment to the storm makers and take the grain and other crops. Among those blinded with profound stupidity that they believe these things could happen, we have seen many people in a kind of meeting exhibiting four captives, three men and one woman, as if they had fallen from these very ships. As I have said, they exhibited these four who had been chained up for some days, with such a meeting finally assembling in our presence as if these captives ought to be stoned. But when truth had prevailed, however, after much argument, the people who had exhibited the captives in accordance with the prophecy were confounded, as the thief is confounded when he is taken. These beliefs persisted for centuries, but they surfaced occasionally in legal proceedings. Unlike the great witch hunt of the Renaissance, trials based on accusations of maleficium, predating the witch trials, were were pretty rare. This is because they looked much more like a civil procedure to Zay. What that means is, you know, I would sue Olivia if she done sent her pests to my sheep, as opposed to the state suing Olivia for committing a capital offense. So a charge of maleficium uh, is not being made by the state or the village. It's being made by one individual against another individual. I say that Mary Ellen did bewitch mine flagpole, such that it might no longer rise above half-staff. What proof have you? See this buxom wench I've brought as evidence. Come forth, dear wench, and let me put look upon your arse. Good day, your honor. You may gander, sir. Now, Magistrate, if you would kindly fasten your gaze into my codpiece, not a twitch. I'm not convinced. The accuser prosecuted the case himself without the assistance of counsel, and if he failed to prove his case, he would suffer a talion, which means that he would have to pay a penalty for falsely accusing his neighbor. So if I couldn't prove that Olivia cursed my pests, or done pested me, pested my sheeps, then I'd have to pay her. Yeah, which in, in, if it was... 
you could just that wouldn't be the same right it's like you can it is like hearsay is like a thing that they'll there's like evidence instead it's like you can like call out well it's like you were saying earlier you throw a bunch of people's name in and then you get free and then it goes down the so same thing with the like the jews yeah. during the inquisition oh, yes, big absolutely. time and stuff like that mm-hmm. anyway but yeah, as you're saying, this is a very different legal proceeding. Yeah, it's like totally different. Yeah. I'm on the line when I make this accusation, which is going to discourage me yeah. from accusing you in the first place, unless I really think I can prove it. Right. This could mean, by the way, a talion could include a year in prison, in addition to my fine. In one case in Strasbourg, a man who failed to prove his case against a woman was convinced uh, was convicted of calumny and drowned in the river ill. Damn. And a lot of the times I think... I guess maybe not in like the civil aspect, but in the normal, like if you were someone who's accused of witchcraft, it's like part of their percentage of their stuff went to the church. Oh, it could happen. Yeah. There's... It was like, uh, there's a, That's like a fine. very specific, like, yeah, I can't remember. It's been too long since I had to read it. Uh, wench, feast upon this carrot. Mm. So deliciously, if you would. Mm. See your honor, mine con piece stirs not. It is curious, I suppose. Perhaps this requires a test. Without a confession or clear proof, a judge might resort to an ordeal in which the accused was bound and thrown in water, sinking if he was innocent, since water rejected the impure, or asked to handle a hot coal, or thrust his arm in boiling water. For the rich, the ordeal might be a test of single combat between champions. (laughs) This is all real. (laughs) We see this on these, you know fantasy shows but it's a real thing if the accused could withstand this test they were free and the accuser would be punished again it comes back on the accuser if these procedures seem a little medieval they actually weren't medieval these were pre-medieval in the 13th century they were replaced by canonical purgation by which the accused swore an oath and then several compurgators or oath keepers vouched that the oath could be trusted So that's a whole lot less brutal than the boiling water. Legal proceedings were tilted so far in the accused's favor that communities able to agree on a case of maleficium sometimes resorted to mob violence, lynching the accused instead of bothering with a trial. I, Mary Ellen of Marbyshire, do solemnly swear I did not cast a spell upon mine one-time lover's shaft, which in my observation has always leaned to the left and has been somewhat reluctant to join these festivities once the parade has begun, irregardless of any sorcery. And I vouch for Mary Ellen. Wench! How could you? You've been calling me a wench all day. My name is Alice. A wench deserves a little respect. The accused is hereby acquitted. String this man up by his flag bowl. Post haste. (laughs) Hooray! For the most part, witchcraft accusations tended to function according to a mold that goes back to ancient tribal life. In tribal communities, shamans would be called in to address cases of witchcraft. Someone experienced some misfortune in their cattle, their crops, their womb, or their testicles, and accused someone else of bewitching them. The whole community got up in arms with gossip circulating and people taking sides. The shaman was then called in to effect a cure of the bewitched person, which was done publicly in a way that resolved the now village-wide conflict. In Europe... Cultural circumstances dictated that the accused was often an older woman between the ages of 50 and 70, generally married or widowed, and rarely ever a spinster. That's interesting. Family members of witches were accused on the notion that such practices ran in the bloodline. Some women were self-professed white witches who used their power to heal, but this led neighbors to wonder if it could also be used to harm. So you might, you're, you know, you might tell your neighbor, oh, I, I, can, I see you've been limping there. Can I help you with some magic? And your neighbor two weeks later will be like, you witch. Yes. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't help anyone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. <laughs> You should help people. Yeah, because it's not those times anymore. Others took credit for harming neighbors through supernatural means for their own reasons and perhaps because they believed they really had. So you could also talk yourself into it whether or not it was true. But these folk traditions and all their variation and eccentricity never amounted to anything like a panic of mass executions. Lynchings aside, there was no medieval witch craze until the church 
got involved and began to panic over fantasies of witches' sabbats. These fantasies were likely spurred by fractures within the church presaged by the early heretics like the Valdensians and brought to full flower with the rise of Protestantism. Torture replaced ordeal in these proceedings, and in cases where the authorities sought to uncover a conspiracy, torture almost always yielded the evidence that the inquisitors or authorities sought. The combination of belief in the Sabbath, tortures, and asking for co-conspirators was relatively rare. But when these three horsemen arrived together, it led to mass executions and the annihilation of whole communities. So I don't, I, I can't say enough that the witch craze wasn't everywhere. But whenever these three things came together, it was cataclysmic for the community that was visited this way. I mean, we talk about Salem in the U.S. It's not like it happened all up and down the coast. But in Salem, it was cataclysmic. Yeah. It's the same format for really any, like, one that would have been considered a heretic. Yeah. It's oh, the all these heretical format. groups. Yeah, the Waldensians. Yeah, and it's, like, Fratichelli. all different yeah. areas and different, like, it's not necessarily, like, everywhere all the time. It's just, like, yeah. Yeah. My take here, the great witch hunt continues to hold important lessons for us today if we reflect on these factors. The witch's Sabbath represents a deeply held but poorly evidenced belief that deserved to be questioned before it was allowed to hurt people. It's a preconceived notion that was allowed to infiltrate the justice system to horrible effect. Also, coercing a confession is no way to arrive at the truth. This is definitely a lesson for the criminal justice system but also for the scholar analyzing confessions in a historical or anthropological context. Finally, people lie for lots of reasons, but most often to avoid punishment. The notion that reliable information can come out of a person who believes they can somehow escape prosecution is deeply flawed. The most honest confessions come from people who are out of the line of fire. This, again, reflects on criminal justice procedures, but... Also in our daily lives, as we raise our children, run our classrooms and businesses, and commune with our neighbors and friends. If we attempt to arrive at the truth through a threat, we may find ourselves the author of our own little witch panic that can quickly go from little to big if we aren't careful to check our vengeful impulses. Final thoughts, Olivia? Well, mm. <laughs> so many thoughts. So many yeah, thoughts. Yeah, I guess it's like, uh, like I, I've, I've always been fascinated with like inquisitorial, like the whole system of law and like, I don't know. It's interesting to me because like a lot of like, even when you were just talking, like I just kept thinking about like in America, how we even have plea deals mm -hmm. and how a lot of like, if you look at plea deals, it, it ruins in air quotes, the sanctity of, you know, the justice system because it's like it fucks up the whole system and it, it throws kind of that same, like, well, if you admit to something, even if you didn't do it, you'll get off. But you know, I don't know. This and you can name co-conspirators. Oh, right. Exactly. It's the same kind of, so it, it almost like when I read about like inquisitorial stuff, it's like, yeah, we've, we've come a long way, but then there's little, little pieces where I'm like, Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Also, I kept trying to, this is a total side note, remember the name of like what it was called. Is it like tied to the secular hand? No, it's something to the secular hand. <laughs> when they would hand you when the church, when you would be burned at the stake by the, the secular, church. Yeah, the secular arm or the secular hand. That's yeah, just it's it. something. You're, you're given over to the secular something, arm. Yeah, yeah, I can't remember, but I freaking love that phrase. That's what happened with Joan of Arc. Yeah, and like a lot of shit ton of jewish people well, because and, the like, church could not murder you because it was against the two yeah, commandments so but the state like, could murder they you. had to like hand you over in a certain way and i was I, that was one of those things remitted like, class. Is it remitted to the secular arm i can't remember but it was because i did this game for my class where it was like a witch hunt but i did it like oh, never cool. have i ever <laughs> but the questions were things like you know like Never have I ever had a birthmark I couldn't explain or like... <laughs> Rode on a shovel. Yeah, like really specific or like, you know... Seen a barbed penis. Yeah, <laughs> like it was very like, I don't know, and there was like a scale of things, but then their punishment at the end would be, oh, being handed over to the secular arm, I yeah, think is what it was. There you go. But yeah, the fun game. Fun game. And we should <laughs> all... Class. We should all dread being remitted to the secular arm, being handed over to the secular arm of the state.
Hmm. All right, Olivia, get us out of here before we're remitted to the secular arm. I, oh God, I hereby adjourn and declare close this meeting of the Secret Order of Alchemical Actors till such time as we get together and do it again. So many friends helping us out on this episode. We got Johnny Cook. We got uh, Mims, Andrew Mims. We got uh, Boxy Olson. We got Neil Sigman. We got uh, Maddie Wagner and Malik Hopkins. Uh, some of my new crew of students here uh, getting involved in the old voice game. Thank you all for listening to our great witch hunt episode, my tribute to Norman Kahn. Coming up next, here on Occult Confessions, we are going to work our way to Salem. Working our way to Salem, <laughs> running fast, because the witch hunts are coming. Do, 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 oh, yeah, crossing that ocean. Do, 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 now do, it's time do, for Party do, in the USA. Uh, <laughs> our particular... <laughs> I was thinking when you said that, because I'm a nerd, I'm like, but there is no USA. Uh, (laughs) Take it up with Miley. I don't know what to tell you. (laughs) There is now, because we're in Salem. Well, there's going to be. Um, So we're going to actually go at the story of Salem through the lens of Tituba, uh, who was the first, you know, she was the center of the witchcraft accusations. Representation. Yeah, yeah. I do want to get some of that... uh, some of that voice, uh, history from below uh, perspective on Salem, not just all this, you know, rich white girl stuff. Yeah, get them out of here. <laughs> this isn't this isn't the crucible. We're giving her giving her her dues. Right? Yeah, she's gonna get more than those five lines here. Yeah. Here on occult confessions. Bye.